Welcome back, our holdover co-hosts from the first segment. That would be the Admiral Bill Stubblefield. Billy. Good morning, Rob. Feels good to be a holdover. <laughs> <laughs> you right, know, Mike? <laughs> I'm with you. I'm with you there, Bill. <laughs> Better be brought back than left back. <laughs> also, the delegate, uh, Michael Height, the Badger. Good morning. Great to be here. Welcome back, and, Michael. And, and a holdover. And a holdover. <laughs> The longest tenured holdover that we have is Michael Carl. As he uh, sits in the Michael Carl seat. Good morning, sir. Good morning, everybody. Wonderful to have you. Great to be here. Mr. Schultz. Good morning, everybody. Beautiful day out there. It is. Via telephone, Joseph Joey Toots for ready. Hello, folks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that sounded uh, very chipper. <laughs> yeah, good sounded you, authentic, yeah. too. Hello, folks. I'm uh-huh. eager to join the fray. Uh, gentlemen, we appreciate y'all being here, and uh, let's get this thing started once and again. And we go a little something like this. Hit it. Like the Bee Gees once sang, here we are in a room full of strangers, but that's not our Friday Five, for better or worse, regardless of the dangers. You'd better believe it's a Friday, and Mike Carl is present in all forms, and there's no doubt he'll be back to his Biden-bashing norms. <laughs> It was Hornby last week, and it's height now, but regardless, it's a Michael. And once again, he's unopposed in this general election cycle. Larry Schultz returns in all his bearded glory. And just like Paul Harvey, when it comes to Trump, he's got the rest of the story. (laughs) Joe Ferretti is back, and he's ready to rejoin the flow. And after a couple of minutes of stupid rhymes, he'll actually lead off this show. (laughs) That leaves us with Bill Stubblefield, the Admiral, the one that's cooler. And just like us, he puts his pants on one leg at a time. It's just that his pockets are fuller. (laughs) (laughs) No, 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 no. (laughs) No, 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 no. no. (laughs) What a week it has been, be you a citizen or an undocumented dreamer. And if you're an illegal, you actually had it better in this country last week than the tax-paying Americans who work for FEMA. We're just 18 days away from the November general election, but with all the focus on the White House, the local races are escaping detection. In fact, it's been kind of quiet around here in this part of the nation. Why, we haven't even aired a single ad about chemical casterization. (laughs) Thank goodness. (laughs) No ads running uh, accusing conservatives of being too liberal or too scary. It's like Republicans used up all their energy attacking each other in the primary. I guess we've reached the point in this state where Republicans running against Republicans is what's fun. Maybe because now when they run against Democrats, it's like the election has already won. Meanwhile, around the state, the news broke that we may still need a buyer. And there it was on the auction block yet again. Yep, you guessed it, the green briar. Well, it's apparently off again as the start of this intro. Feel free to interrupt me if that changes again before we start the show. And what a week to be Catholic, as the church paid out another 800 million bucks, and then somehow sunk even lower by inviting Harris and Trump to share a few yucks. And what a way to end the week for my religion, as the Catholic church cleared another suit off the slate, and paid out that record $880 million for abuse cases in the Diocese of Los Angeles, hey, past the collection plates. And while the... (laughs) And while the church was rounding up the money to pay out all those bucks, they were hosting Harris and Trump, inviting them to share their yucks. They say politics make strange bedfellows, and this week's was an example, as the candidates switched media sites, and here's just a sample. Donald Trump went on NPR while Kamala Harris went on Fox with Brent Baer, causing liberals and conservatives to simultaneously pull out their hair. Confronted with his enemies, within, quote, the father of IVF doubled down, and reiterated his stance to bring the National Guard or the military to town. Meanwhile, Harris was muscling up her courage like Popeye eating spinach when she tired of being interrupted and blurted out to Brent, to Bre- uh, to Brent Blair. <laughs> Just kick that line. <laughs> that was a tongue twister. Meanwhile, Harris was muscling up her courage like Popeye eating spinach when she tired of being interrupted and blurted out to Brent Blair, may I please finish? As Bear responded meekly, yes, ma'am, I thought he got himself in quite the jam. At that moment, Kamala sounded more like my mother trying to scold me for not using good manners despite what she told me. But do I want my mother in the White House giving me that look like she's Barbara Billingsley from Leave it to Beaver? No, but I also don't want my crazy grandfather in there either. (laughs) There are a lot of Americans who might have run for president 
but for a variety of reasons couldn't. And maybe a lot more Americans who see these two running and wish they wouldn't. Kicked intros and all, that's the conclusion <laughs> of that one right there. A, a great show today, Rob. See you Monday. Let's see if it improves as uh, Joe leads off the show uh, with issue number one. Joseph, it'll be easy to follow me today. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, the, uh, uh, unfortunately, the references to the Catholic Church have brought me down. But uh, I'll try to pick it up here. And I'll point uh, out for clarity that I am a... Catholic, I think Joe is too. Yeah, and I join you in that. And, and uh, well, enough said. Uh, anyhow, so Rob, uh, as early as in recorded history as 399 BC, Socrates had been placed in jail, accused of corrupting the youth of Athens, and he awaited a death sentence. A uh, vial of hemlock was brought to him, and history still debates today whether he consumed the product himself and, and killed himself or whether it was administered to him. But it was one of the most earliest cases of medically assisted death. And I bring that uh, subject up because as we go to vote in West Virginia, on the ballot at the very end, uh, when you're probably bleary-eyed and uh, done with the process, you have to decide whether or not to amend the West Virginia Constitution with, as the ballot states, to protect West Virginians or residents from medically assisted suicide. Now, I, I bring this up because I, I think this is a, a wrong approach to this process. I, I, I'll leave it to Mike Height to explain the legislature's thinking behind this. But we already have a law in the books in West Virginia that prohibits those activities. This ballot initiative really is asking West Virginia residents to vote on whether or not they want to enshrine this protection in the West Virginia Constitution. And I think that's a mistake because – as we've seen in other states, the thinking regarding medically assisted death it changes over time. Other, there's now, I think, nine or ten states in this country that permit the practice uh, with very clear safeguards and procedures that have to be followed before you can do such a thing with the assistance of a doctor. Uh, and but the West Virginia legislature wanting to enshrine this in our Constitution is going to take away any future debate regarding this matter, because we know it's it's difficult, as we learned in the last election, to amend the West Virginia Constitution. But if we do so in this case, with this rather vague expression of protections that uh, the legislature feels we we need, by amending the Constitution here, we make it very difficult to ever discuss the moral, ethical, legal implications of medically assisted death. So I think this is a mistake. I think that we should not be having this enshrined in the Constitution. I think the laws on the books, which allow the legislature to evaluate, amend those laws, change them as the thinking in our society changes, I think that is the preferred method in terms of debating these issues in the future. So uh, I want to know what other folks think about this, but I think that this ballot initiative and this, this effort to amend the Constitution is the wrong approach on this issue. Okay, thank you. Joe, let's begin with the Admiral Bill Stubblefield. Yeah, Joe, uh, you're kind of putting a different twist on this than what I thought you were. And the twist I'm, I'm understanding now is for uh, public debate and how we should curb or encourage public debate. Uh, I thought when you introduced this last night uh, that it's going to be strictly upon the merits of the proposal. And I found it to be... Uh, uh, some hypocrisy here. Uh, we keep telling ourselves we're for personal liberties. Uh, we uh, you send your school uh, children to whatever school you want. Uh, keep out of a pocketbook. Uh, personal liberties are very important. But yet, if it comes to certain things that are that are very, very, very personal, we do not really encourage personal liberties, i.e. transgender rights, uh, abortion rights, and the like. This is another one, I think, that falls in that same category. Uh, 
I have never walked in someone's shoes that is every day is full of pain or every day that's going to be a uh, condition becomes worse. I like to say the Lou Gehrig's disease is that uh, it's going to be very progressive. And if you cure it to the end, you, all the organs will be shutting down. Uh, you cannot breathe. And uh, it's just it's supposed to be a horrible death, expectation of death. Uh, if someone wants to... Uh, uh, circumvent that and take action on the hands uh that i think is their personal choice uh, i may not agree with it i may never want to do it myself but i i'm hesitant to tell somebody what they should or should not be eligible to do especially on the basic elements of life larry schultz yes <clears throat> one of the problems uh with this proposal is it will do what we've done in a number of different areas under the law of West Virginia. That will still be available, um, medically assisted suicide, whatever the proper term is, it will still be privately available to wealthy people. It's really just poor people who won't get to make that choice. I think if we're going to waste our time amending our Constitution, that we ought to amend our Constitution to make sure that every county has a CPS worker to protect our most vulnerable citizens. This is a bunch of flag-waving nonsense. As Joe says, it's already illegal. And how many prosecutions have we had recently? Oh, does that mean nobody's doing it? Or does that mean they're just doing it on the down low? And what difference is it going to make if suddenly what they're violating is a constitutional provision instead of a criminal statute that, that some people are already ignoring. So I, I just don't see, I just see this as someone saying, hey, look at me, uh, I'm, I'm a, a famous pro-lifer. Uh, while that same person <clears throat> goes through their life turning their nose up at the fact that Morgan County, West Virginia, children who are abused do not have a CPS worker in their county. Let's focus on the actual issues of life and not this political nonsense. Delegate Pat McGeehan is the sponsor for this bill, the lead sponsor. Um, I, having interviewed Pat and, and having known Pat for a dozen years, I don't think this is a flag-waving bill for him. I think Pat is just that kind of person from a moral standpoint and his Catholic roots and, and, and such, strong believer of the Catholic faith and strong follower of it, that I believe he morally feels this is the right thing to do. Uh, I don't think this is a flag-waving issue for him. Uh, I, obviously, I can't speak literally for Pat, but just in the interviews I've done with him and knowing him as I do over the years, I, I wouldn't call this one a flag-waving issue for him. Just my thought on that. Mike Carl. I find myself in the rare situation of agreeing with uh, both the lawyers, <laughs> the other lawyers in this group. Um, uh, it, it's just... It's it's against the law now. Why fool? You know why waste the time, effort, and everything else to put it in the Constitution? Uh, and you know the enforcement of it is so uh, you know dubious anyway. It's 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 just a waste of time. Mike Height. Um, you know I think I think the reason behind this is we. We say that it's not really happening here in West Virginia, but I, I think this could be preemptive. And, and what I mean by that is if you look at other states in, in the country um, that are allowing this, uh, you can even look at, at Oregon, who's made a cottage in industry of it. Um, it, it they invite you to Oregon um, to have your medically assisted suicide and you can go to the doctor and you can get a prescription um, to to take in in the, your hotel room or whatever and and just die in peace um, and and that's something that they they set up and, and organized for you in Oregon the problem with this is I don't I don't know that I agree with uh, Joe, that this there's all these uh, safeguards in place that you know you can you can get this assistance because you're depressed. Um, well, there's sometimes underlying issues that could be addressed rather than just ending one's life. Um, and I, I think 
uh, Delegate McGeehan's fear is that there are there are times when uh, people feel like they've become a burden and uh, they are pushed in a certain direction to end their life as to not be a burden on their family uh, or or friends or, or whatever and, and I don't know that that's uh, morally where we should we should be going uh, every life is precious and I think that's what uh, Dele- Delegate McGeehan is trying to, to portray here and that our first reaction should be to treat that life and make it as full as possible uh, for however long that that person's going to be on earth so uh, I I'd like to hear more about this in the in the coming months um, and uh, I've heard Pat talk about it I would like to hear the arguments on the other side of why this is needed uh, why medically assisted suicide is needed um, but at first I, I feel like I agree with uh, Delegate McGee and, and I don't have a problem with this at all. The uh, Joe, uh, it's a couple more points on this from the interview we did with Pat uh, uh, McGee on this. There was uh, some concerns he had about the possibility in the future of insurance companies taking a look at what the cost of care is for a terminal patient versus the cost of an ejection to end your life and then effectively covering things based on cost, which is we'll cover the $250 it takes to put the needle in your arm, but if you want uh, the care for this uh, debilitating long-term terminal disease, we're not going to cover that. Uh, That was part of Pat's concerns regarding that too. But overall, you can take that out of it because that, lawyers can tell you, can be fixed with a couple of well-written sentences uh, or at least sentences that are written well enough but still ambiguous enough that someone can appeal the case later to drive up more fees for attorneys. (laughs) <laughs> but it, it, but the, the, the approach is really the overall aspect of respect for life. And this is kind of timely because uh, this was part of the sermon at Mass within the last week or two from the priest that I, with the church that I go. Uh, the other part of the sermon was, if you can kick in an extra $880 million, we need it right now. More on that later. Uh, but it has to do... With an overall respect for life. Sounds like you're recruiting Mr. Stubblefield. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and, yeah. And, and before you go, Bill, yeah. the, the respect for life, it's not just pro-life on pregnancies. It's the death sentence. It's assisted suicide. It's an overall respect for the sanctity of life and the belief in the church and many, if not all, Christian churches that only God can stop a life legally and, and, and from there's murder and I understand that but that's that's obviously illegal and immoral. And and that's where life ends, when God says life ends. Not your decision to abort your child, not your decision to vote for capital punishment, not your decision to vote for physician assisted suicide. And this is where Pat is coming from this. You're either all in on respect for life or you're not in there's no in between there's no dipping your toe in the water on respect for life and i admire the consistency of that stance because there are many people who point out larry schultz that sure you're you're not for abortion but you'll vote for killing that you know the death penalty well that's that's not respect for life pat's exhibiting a consistency with this bill in respect for life well i can tell you that in the 20 or so years that i was a catholic um, you got up. Nobody be- you ever- got up before you had to kick in for the settlements. Is that what? Yeah. That was? <laughs> um, nobody ever suggested to me that the way I would demonstrate my love for my fellow man was by amending my state's constitution, especially when I'm a part of an organization, the West Virginia Legislature, that is daily ignoring the needs of the most vulnerable children in this state. So I don't want to see that. It's still flag waving as far as I'm concerned. You can dress it up, but no priest ever told me, go run for the legislature and amend the Constitution. That wasn't my task as a Catholic, and I don't think it really has anything. You got out early because that's becoming more and more part of the sermons, which is supporting pro-life candidates, and and that sort of thing is something that's starting to work its way more into the usual Sunday. Joe Ferretti, I'll go back to you here for a minute. Well, I... Rob, the, the inconsistency 
and I, I believe me, I, I acknowledge and, and have been preached to many times myself the, the sanctity of life, and, and as you said, that uh, that's determined by a higher power in terms of when life uh, ends. Uh, but yet, in this actual amendment, this ballot initiative, it indicates that the state. Uh, if you vote in favor of, of enshrining this in our Constitution, it does not mean that we that West Virginia cannot proceed with capital punishment. I mean, it's actually in the ballot. Uh, and, and there's an inconsistency there regarding the sanctity of life, yet have this expression that, uh, oh, no, we're not, we're not going to outlaw capital punishment with this uh, amendment. So, uh, you know, I would ask Mr. McGeehan to, to address that inconsistency. But that's what our legislature put on the ballot, and that's what we have to deal with. And I think this overall, uh, because this is a matter of debate, because the U.S. Supreme Court has left it to the states to regulate in this area, we would be the first state in the country to have this placed in our Constitution. Uh, and I just think that's unnecessarily binding us. And it's, it's shielding us from the debates, both on an ethical, moral, and religious basis that should be taking place as to whether or not medically assisted death is something that should be available to folks. This is not uh, medically assisted suicide where, where you, you, know, you just don't think life's worth living because of financial burdens or what have you. You have to, in, in, in the states that have enacted this, and Maine is a, is a prime example, you have to basically be terminally ill, certified by two doctors, and you have to be able to still have the mental faculties to make these decisions yourself. And in fact, you have to administer the drug cocktail yourself. A doctor is not going to inject you. That's illegal. You have to do it yourself with, under the guidance of physicians with the certification of two physicians who you have a long-standing relationship with and who know you. Uh, so there's, there's guardrails in place. And those kind of debates as to whether or not we want that for our citizens in West Virginia, I think is an important debate to have. I think the effort to put this in the Constitution takes away the opportunity to have those debates about whether or not these are the kinds of rights, freedoms, or responsibilities that we want to have. And, and I, I just... That's why I think it's, it's a wrong approach, and I hope that when people go into the ballot, they think about those implications before simply deciding that we need to be protected against medically assisted deaths. Now, I'm, I'm going to push back real quick on the, the discrepancy issue that I, I, because I feel like there is a difference between abortion and euthanasia and the death penalty. Um, the death penalty. Uh, we're not talking about innocent life here. We're talking about somebody who's done something heinous, um, and you know, we think. They're, they're, well, we he's think. he's been tried by a jury of his peers. Sometimes, um, maybe even caught in the act. Um, so, in those cases where the death penalty is warranted, and I don't know that we have it here in West Virginia, but in those cases where it's warranted in other states. I don't have me personally. I don't have a problem with it, and I see the distinction between guilt and innocence, and the innocence of the unborn and the innocence of of those being euthanized uh, are much different than somebody who has been tried and convicted by a jury of their peers for a heinous act. Well, we yeah. just had a case this morning that made the news. Uh, Robert Robertson, I think it was. Texas, they, yeah. Now yeah. in Texas, he was on yes. death row, about to be executed for shaking a baby to death, and then they found out that the kid was actually sick, and that's what caused the kid yeah. to die. Yeah. I mean, it's bad enough you're in, you're grieving the death of your child, and then they accuse you of murdering the kid, and they're about to kill you yeah. over it, too. Well, there's a lot going on there, obviously. Joe, thank you. Good way to start off the program, as always. And thank you for bailing me out from kicking the interest. Appreciate it. <laughs> All right, uh, here we go with the Admiral and issue number two. Yeah, uh, there's 18 days uh, till election, and but who's counting? And during this particular election, there's been a lot of things said. It's one of the more, to use an old Southern expression, one of the more squirrely elections I can remember with the things that were said. One of which recently came out with a Fox interview by when uh, with Trump, and he made a comment said he anticipated chaos on election day from some very bad people. 
some sick people, radicals from the left, lunatics. It can be handled by the National Guard or the military, along with other statements by retribution of his political appointees, has made some, some folks very nervous, especially the military is nervous because they've been kind of pulled into this. There has been a lot of defense, though, uh, on by Trump supporters uh, putting this in a, a, a different perspective. My question to my colleagues is, are these statements something that we just normally expect during an election cycle? Something that we should be alarmed about? Or something we just kind of dismissed as Trump being Trump? Well, there's only one expert in the room on Trump being Trump, <laughs> and that's Larry Schultz. Larry? Yeah, um, of course, um, there's always a choice when Donald Trump says something. Uh, as to whether he's just blathering mindlessly or whether he's serious. Um, this is a very serious topic um, to the extent that Donald Trump ever has uh, power to control the United States military. He will violate the existing law and use it in any way he can. And then we'll be in a position where the military is defending not against some enemy, but against their commander-in-chief. And they will find a way, I would hope, uh, to ignore or blow off or um, push back uh, 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 at the top of the military on these sort of insane ideas. And that's what this is. It's insanity to suggest that we're going to deploy the United States military against Donald Trump's opponents um, on the streets of our country is to take a jump, not a step, but a jump from a democracy to um, an insane autocrat uh, setup, autocratic setup. So that's a very serious thing to say. You would think that a sane person would not say it unless they really meant it. On the other hand, you kind of hope that this is an insane person talking and he doesn't even understand what it would mean. It just sounds cool. Um, that's kind of a bad spot to be in for anybody in the United States, including, I would think, Trump supporters. Mr. Ferretti. Well, uh, let me think how this goes. Bill, what he really means is if there is unrest and and protest on the order of Minneapolis after the George Floyd situation, that he's going to call in the National Guard and try to restore order. That's what he really means when he says stuff like this. Uh, now, I don't think that there's going to be a bunch of left-wing lunatics out there causing all kind of mayhem after the election. I think a lot of folks uh, on the right and left learned their lesson after January 6th and the legal implications that arise from such conduct. So I don't think that that's uh, going to happen. But I can tell you the, the risk I see surrounding this election in the days afterwards, when we don't have a declared winner and Pennsylvania is still counting their ballots, there is a whole cadre of new lawyers that Trump and, and the Republicans have ready at the uh, get-go to file a bunch of motions and court cases to contest a lot of these state uh, counting of ballots and, and ultimately their certifications. Uh, the last cadre of lawyers he had, they've been disbarred, <laughs> like uh, John Eastman and, uh, and Rudy Giuliani. So he's got a whole new group of lawyers who are going to now come forward with a bunch of lawsuits. So you can expect that situation to repeat itself but uh, as to whether or not there's going to be uh, such uh, a rancor from the left that the national guard needs to be called in uh, I, I would doubt that's going to happen and i hope it's not going to happen but uh, I, I this is not going to be a neat and clean election in terms of of acceptance of results there's going to be a lot of challenges because the precedent has been set and we're going to revisit uh, 2020 all over again, in my opinion. So if the last group got disbarred, how do you recruit the next group, Joe? Oh, there's plenty of lawyers, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> I've noticed. I've got three on this show. <laughs> all with high morals. <laughs> Speaking of high morals, here's Michael Carl. Well, uh, first of all, 
Trump can't. It, it, there's a, a more almost uh, more than two months from the election <laughs> to when he takes office, so the rioting would 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 be awful, and and you would assume that even Biden, uh, if it's as bad as as, tr- as what Trump described, you know, and and then we've had some terrible, violent protests, you know, a lot of it on the left, but uh, regardless. Uh, and that would, uh, before Trump could actually, you know, take that action, you know, there would be almost, uh, two months have gone by. So it would need, it would be absolutely legitimate to take action if, if the outgoing administration hasn't done it. It'd be two and a half months from election day to, uh, transfer of power, January the 20th. Bill? No, Mike, I, I, oh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, I'm going to agree with with Joe here. I, I think it's what what did he mean by this? I don't think he meant that he was going to call in the military because Mike's right. He doesn't have the authority to do that. Even if he is elected in November, he won't have that authority um, until sometime in January. I think what he was referring to, like Joe said, is that there should be uh, a call up of the National Guard to make sure that there aren't riots. Uh, no matter who wins, and and that the, to keep peace and order in the streets um, after this election because it is such a hotbed. I I think that's what he meant to say. And I've said on here many times I'm not a big Trump supporter, um, but I, I truly think that's what he meant by that. Um, after those statements, <clears throat> excuse me. After those statements, there were a lot of people that referred to him as being a fascist because of those statements. I find that very interesting because very quietly, while all this was going on, the DOD under the Biden administration just recently authorized lethal force against U.S. citizens when they are accompanying uh, law enforcement in certain areas to help with riots. And that is a huge change from where we have been uh, when we bring in the the, the National Guard uh, or military in any way, that we have never authorized lethal force on our own citizens. And now we have under this administration, not Trump. So to me, that seems a whole lot more fascist than anything Trump has said. So uh, I, I don't I don't put a whole lot of stock in, in what Trump has said about this. Well, you mentioned never authorized lethal force. Kent State, unfortunately, we did authorize uh, that. But I'm not sure since uh, subsequent. Not since. Yeah. Yeah. The other one that I uh, kind of mentioned but nobody picked up on was retribution. Was this a casual thrown out in the air without any meat to it, or is there some real threat to the uh, retribution of political opponents? I, I, I also wanted to say that you know, there were violent protests on the left when the police killed George Floyd and at other times. What we haven't had until Donald Trump came along and provided it was a violent protest at the nation's capital over an election result. Are you comparing these riots to, to what happened on January 6th? Yes. How can you do that? Okay. Tell pretty, me about the simple. shots that were fired and the people killed. Pretty simple. There were people killed. Ashley Babbitt was killed. Um, other other people died killed? afterwards, but they, they were killed by the security forces trying to protect our capital. Mike, they tried to overthrow a fair election. A guy like that, I don't care and what he And the vice thinks. president of that same administration said no, and it he, didn't happen. He said no as they chanted, hang Mike Pence. They can chant all they want. Donald that's Trump, free speech. Donald but, Trump but, but, has recently come out was told that Mr. Pence was in trouble and said, so what? So don't tell me that this is hiding behind some sheen of uh, uh, respectability. It was a shameful moment in American history, and that's what Donald Trump is talking about. That's what he's talking about, the ability to punish his enemies with the United States military. And as we have pointed out, the, the 
elected, newly elected president doesn't have any power whatsoever well, the for fact, two and a half months. The fact that he's so demented he doesn't understand that is just another reason not you, to vote for you him. You think he doesn't understand that? I'm, I'm very sure there are a lot of things that might surprise you but not me about what he doesn't understand. And on that I note, did my job, Rob. Bill? I did my job. <laughs> I, I, thought, I thought I saw the ghost of the cheetah appear in the room at one point along <laughs> yeah. the way. Yeah, yeah, and the badger waiting on the sidelines, ready to pounce if the cheetah fell. All right. And speaking of the badger, we go to him for issue number three. All right, I'm going to talk uh, nationally as well. Um, most national polls, and I, I, I look at polls through real, real clear politics because it shows you all of the polls and averages them together. Um, most of the national polls still favor uh, Kamal Harris um, by about one and a half points is the average. Um, however, all of the battle, battleground states now tr favor Trump by a slight margin. So does this indicate that we are going to have possibly a Trump win through the Electoral College, but yet not have it through the plurality votes. It's an interesting breakdown within those stats with Harris up by, I think it's 14 or 15 points with women, but Trump up, uh, especially with white males, I think by 18 points. And there's the difference there. And then the poll came out earlier this week that uh, Harris was actually now polling worse with black males in this country. So anyway, back to Mike's question. On to you, Bill, for the response. Yeah, uh, Mike, I think that's a very real possibility, uh, as close as it is, uh, that it, we could have it determined electoral college is different than popular votes. But I think in this situation, polls are not getting to the kernel of the issue. Uh, I do, uh, polls, they're so close as far as opinions. The, I think the election is going to be determined not upon the opinion as much as turnout and who is going to be in a better position for turnout. When you're dealing with probably less than, than a percent, polls are not going to pick up the subtlety. The turnout's going to make the difference. And this kind of comes back, and this is where the uh, Harris folks are somewhat optimistic, is that they have a more refined, a more aggressive ground game than what uh, Trump has. Uh, Trump has been using contracts to do this as opposed to the more traditional volunteers. Uh, I think at this point in time, Mike, it could go either way. Anybody, and again, the polls, real clear politics are misleading at this point because they do the polls of the polls. Some are actually designed to, uh, to paint somewhat of a different picture, trying to either stimulate or discourage voters on that particular side. So a lot of confusion now with the polls. Uh, but again, I still think it's not the polls are not equipped to pick up the subtleties in this tighter race. It's going to be turnout and turnout alone. Mr. Ferretti. Did you mute yourself, Joe? I think I think Joe muted his phone. Sorry, yeah. sorry about that. <laughs> Mike, I, I, I think there's two likely outcomes here, uh, and both involve Kamala Harris winning the popular vote. I think she's going to win the popular vote hands down. Whether she wins the Electoral College or not is another matter. And I think one of the two scenarios is that either she wins both or Trump wins the Electoral College tally but loses the popular vote. And... Uh, it's hard. To, I mean, I'm not going to predict how, which scenario is the most likely at this point. I think it's a complete toss up. But bottom line is uh, it raises again the question about the Electoral College. What I find interesting is uh, some state legislatures now are considering uh, amending uh, their laws in, in their states where their electoral votes are cast and certified based upon the national election results. Uh, Minnesota is one such state that is considering uh, doing away with, and uh, in, in the national election for president, doing away with counting the votes just within the confines of Minnesota and then having their electoral votes be cast based upon the national results. Uh, I think you might see other states start looking at that seriously um, and and it's uh, 
Uh, it's going to be interesting to see the legal wrangling that takes place over that. But bottom line is, historically, uh, there's only been five presidents in this country uh, going back to the late uh, 1700s who have lost the popular vote and still won the presidency. And Donald Trump was one of those in 2016. And if he wins again, he'll be the only two-time president to lose the popular vote but still win the office of president. I point out that Bill Clinton in neither election received a majority of the vote. He just he won on a plurality both times as well. Another statistical anomaly. On and that Al vote. Gore the same way. Al Gore won the popular vote and lost the electoral vote. Larry? Um yeah, that's a um, a feature. I think it's always, when the race is this close, a potential problem. Um, I did want to point out that, yeah, Clinton won with a plurality, but he had more votes than his opponent. He won mm-hmm. the popular vote against his uh, number one opponent. That's how he he's former President Clinton and not former ran for president and lost Clinton. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, And so there's a there's a distinction there. Most Americans think, and who do not follow it closely, that if you get more votes, you're the president. And as Hillary Clinton could tell you, that ain't so. Uh, I believe her win was by 4 million votes. And she still lost the Electoral College. And so it's it's possible uh, that we could have that same situation here. Um, Chances are pretty good that it will favor the Republican if we do. Um, but I tend to agree with Bill. Um, the numbers from Georgia's early vote double what they were in the record 2020 vote. Uh, the early vote numbers on the first day of early voting and the second day set a record as well. So I think the turnout in some of these states is going to be beyond anything anyone ever understood or thought about. And that means the polls will be not very helpful in determining what's going to happen before it does happen. I believe early voting begins tomorrow in Berkeley County, if I have that correct, October 19. Michael Carl. Well, I share the cynicism about polling, uh, 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 particularly as it it relates to actual turnout. And uh, I think, uh, you know, so I'm I'm not uh, swayed, you know, by, uh, you know, what what the – national polls are certainly it's meaningless and it's meaningless because you know as a native west virginian i revere the electoral college system and that is that is what really matters um uh, but i you know i'm i'm not sure that 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 trump won't get a a majority of the of the actual cast votes nation nationwide but, uh, but what matters, of course, is that he gets the Electoral College win. And there are, uh, I think, Nebraska, was it? that there was an, They split their electoral votes, and they were trying, the legislature had made an attempt to try to stop that. Yeah, Nebraska and Maine, that was yeah. kind of interesting. Uh, Maine was debating about doing that, and Nebraska kind of talked them out of it. Uh, and so Nebraska is right now is the only state in play, and the legislators uh, were contemplating uh, making it reducing removing that one vote. And in fact, uh, uh, Trump's allies went over there and lobbied very hardly hard to that happen. It mm-hmm. did not. So they uh, Nebraska is uh, has a outlier one vote. Omaha. Did, did Omaha Maine did, change it? No, Maine, Maine did, did not, not change it. Maine okay. did not change it. So Maine uh, did. Again, it was a. Uh, and when Nebraska made their play to uh, perhaps eliminate it, it's too late for Maine to take action. So Maine is uh, is locked in the way it is. And even even with Nebraska, their their separation is by congressional district. So it would be how that congressional district exactly voted. Um, and it, and then the whole state wouldn't be, so I can see that and, and I would be okay with that. I still think you have to go by the electoral college. There's a reason the framers put that in place. And it's because that smaller states like West Virginia and Nebraska and Idaho and the Dakotas, they, they would lose their voice. Even Minnesota, as Joe alluded to, you would lose your voice to the, the, the likes of California and New York uh, if, if you don't keep the electoral college in place. You, you would become irrelevant. 
Yeah, you're right, Mike. Uh, one of the things the Omaha District of Nebraska, where it's interesting, is that a lot of the models will suggest that the Omaha District would be the deciding vote to break the 269-269 uh, uh, tie. Uh, and if it ended up with a tie, then it goes to the House of Representatives. But each state has one vote in, in the presidential election in that case, and, the, uh, uh, and it would be to the advantage of the Republicans if it goes to the House of Representatives. Regardless of the number of voters in the House, each state would have one vote. And I think that outlying Nebraska um, uh, electoral college, yeah. that that congressional district is considered battleground right now. It is it is not clearly one way or the other. So it's it's somewhere in the middle. It could go either way. You you may be right, Mike. But here again, the polls the polls suggest that's a it's it's probably Republican. Excuse me, a Democrat uh, majority in that case. They're calling it the Mike, blue, the blue dot, the blue district. dot, the blue dot, exactly. And yeah. and it's it's just it, people are making signs with yeah. a giant blue yeah. dot on yeah. them and putting them yeah. out yeah. Um, in Nebraska. Joe, you're about to say. Yeah, Mike. I, Mike Hyde's correct uh, regarding the rationale for the electoral college, uh, but we we can't overlook the other problem that arises today, and that is that you've got a presidential election being fought in basically five or six states. Uh, you know, these candidates are not visiting California. They're not visiting Oregon or Washington or uh, uh, probably, you know, three-fourths of the states don't get a visit from these candidates at all during this election. So the issues that are central to Pennsylvania, like fracking, uh, people in Iowa don't give a crap about fracking. Uh, they got their own issues, and they would like to probably hear from these presidential candidates about those issues, but they never get a visit because they're not in play in the electoral college so it's they become foregone conclusions and and so the 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 opposite effect is is taking place here we have a lot of states becoming irrelevant in terms of the presidential politics because they're not in play in the electoral college I, so I, let me push back a little bit real quick joe on that because 60 seconds. I, I think i think places like west virginia and wyoming um are in play and it's the 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 comments that these candidates have made over time that has pushed them to where they are right now when you're trying to stop all fossil fuel um burning of for power plants and so on and so forth obviously west virginia and wyoming are going to go red so they they are in a way already stating w their position and on that, as that was your topic, you got the final say on that, Michael Height. We come back with Larry Schultz on the clock for, and for that, we go to Larry Schultz. Larry. Yes, uh, if you support Mr. Trump's proposed tariffs, explain in simple economic terms how those tariffs will not drive up prices. All right, let's go to our chief economist in the room, Michael Carl. Well, <clears throat> Trump uh, used the threat of tariffs when he was president and it helped the economy of the United States. And that's all, that's all, that's all we're talking about. Uh, I, I, I agree that the tariffs can have an adverse economic effect if they're mismanaged, but I have a lot of confidence in Trump and his advisors to manage them properly and only use them to uh, enhance America's competitiveness in the world market. Mr. Ferretti, if you're unmuted. I, I recall that Trump did actually impose tariffs uh, during his administration, and some of those, to be fair, were uh, maintained and continued by the Biden administration. But now he's talking about uh, a pretty comprehensive package of tariffs uh, over a lot of goods. And uh, uh, I'm an economics major, and I probably forgot everything I learned in college, but I have to believe that, uh, and I've seen where some of these economists have reported out that uh, there's plenty of studies that show that tariffs are eventually are passed down to the consumers uh, when it costs more for supplies and the components to make your widgets. Uh, the price of the widgets go up to reflect the uh, underlying costs in producing that product, and uh, that's what uh, the pricing is on the store shelves then reflecting what the manufacturer had to pay to get that product to market. So it's pretty elementary. Uh, I don't know 
uh, as with a lot of public policy pronouncements Trump makes, there's there's a lacking uh, specificity in terms of what he really intends to do. But uh, he has talked about a comprehensive package, and I would be fearful that that's only going to exacerbate the inflationary pressures that uh, still exist to some extent in, in the economy. So uh, I think it's right to question that. Uh, I'll be curious as to who his economic advisors are uh, if he does win, because uh, uh, I'm hoping they're independent minded people and, and not somebody who's just going to tow Trump line, because we're, we're certainly going to need a check on him if he gets back in the Oval Office. Billy. Yeah, I'm not an economist, uh, so I cannot address it with any uh, self-assurance. However, Wall Street Journal is are, is very, very fearful of instituting these tariffs as Trump has outlined. As I think I remember, uh, uh, he was going to impose a 10% tariff in all goods from China, a 5% tariff from goods from other countries. Just using China as an example, we get so much of our products from China. If there was a 10% tariff imposed, that means our inflation from any goods from China would be jacked up about 10%. Uh, it may be rhetoric. It may be political rhetoric. may not be anything to it. But somewhere, somewhere down the line, we're going to have to say, does he mean what he's saying? Or is he just talking? If he means what he says, then we have some concern. If he's just talking, if it's just for political purposes, then it's it's just that. Mr. Or, uh, Mr. Height here. I was going to say Mr. Carr, but we already talked to you. So I think short term, um, it is bad for the economy. If, if we put tariffs on, on stuff from other countries, it's, it's going to be uh, detrimental to the economy. However, long term, I think maybe not so much. And, and the reason I say that is I think Trump believes that tariffs on foreign goods help preserve American manufacturing. And it, it, it prevents uh, the cheaper goods coming in and destroying what we have here in America because we can't be competitive. And then once you, you take out the manufacturing here in America – then those foreign countries can jack up the prices because there is no competition anymore. So, I, And I think that's what China is, has been trying to do all along. Um, I, I'll bet you can't go into a store right now and buy an American-made can opener. They just don't exist. Why? Because China, Taiwan, other countries have been importing can openers for 10 bucks. Whereas a, a, an American can opener would probably cost you 30, but last four or five times as long. And we've gotten in this society just to be a, a disposal type dis society when it comes to things we buy. If it breaks, throw it away, go buy another one. You don't even try to fix it anymore because it's, it's damn near impossible to fix some of these things. So I think what you've Trump been cursing is, a lot in this show. Today, yeah, sorry. Um, <laughs> I, I think what Trump is trying to do is to protect American manufacturing. And, and does that have a cost? Absolutely, it has a cost. It could be bad for the economy in the short term. However, if you lose those jobs and people are on welfare, it's a whole lot worse for the economy in the long term if we don't have those jobs here in the United States. Yeah, Mike, I don't think we've seen a uh, the economy going bottoms up of uh, some of that. We've shifted to certain sectors, and I'm not advocating this is good, but we've gone from more uh, manufacturers to service sectors. Uh, but it's not just short term. How long is short term? Once inflation is hiked in for a certain product, it doesn't go away. We keep it at that level. So your short term very quickly migrates to midterm, long term. Uh, I'm 
and there and that's not to say that uh, Trump saved all the manufacturing jobs. Uh, he he advocated or promoted certain jobs that never happened. And case in point, the uh, uh, the energy energy production. Uh, we've done more recently with energy production than we had during the Trump era. Now the distribution is a different story, but the production itself was uh, actually increased. Yeah, but look how that has hurt us. I mean, if you look at if you go back. 20, 30 years ago, and and United States was the the premier manufacturer of of computer chips, Silicon Valley, um, one of the richest places in the world, um, and and we led the world in, in that production, and now we don't. We've outsourced it to other countries, Taiwan. Uh, uh, China, other places that can do it a whole lot cheaper. And then look what happened during COVID, when we couldn't get computer chips. There was there was that whole supply issue because we didn't manufacture those things here in the United States anymore. We didn't keep those jobs in the United States because those other countries came in and undercut us with those those but, products. But that's what the Chips Act did specifically, yep. trying to bring those companies back into the U.S. Yes, absolutely, but. If there had been tariffs on those to begin with, and and possibly then we could have kept the, the manufacturing in the United States, it never would have left. One of the things that um, caused uh, us to impose tariffs uh, on China was steel. Okay. And there are limited places where I think most economists agree that a tariff can do you a service. But Donald Trump is talking about blanket tariffs on all kinds of goods from all over the world. And that is going to drive up inflation to a crazy level like we have never seen before. And there will be no Joe Biden around to um, bring the inflation rate back down as he has done in this case. Uh, unfortunately, it will be Donald Trump trying to defend uh, this insane policy. Find me a Nobel Prize candidate economist who thinks that tariffs on all imported goods is a good idea. There aren't any. There simply aren't any. This isn't a matter of debate between economists. It's, yeah, we have to do a little bit of it, but the vast majority of it would be insanity. And uh, that's not even close to being a real question uh, in economic uh, theory. Uh, you are was just about to say what you said in regards to steel, Larry, because I can remember the 70s in Pittsburgh uh, with the mills closing and the uh, the complaints about the Japanese dumping. Remember what was the Japanese we were complaining about? The Japanese dumping of steel. Now it's the Chinese dumping of steel. And they wanted tariffs at the time to try to level the prices. And that was one example where effectively surgically applied tariffs could be something that would be helpful. Overall blanket use of tariffs. I think we've seen, when you look at the economics, someone posted the Smoot-Hawley Tariff Act in our comment section, if you want to go back in history and, and look up that one there. Uh, there's been a, a lot of uh, stuff written about tariffs over the years. Well, we move on now to issue number five, and for that, we go to Michael Carl. <clears throat> uh, well, uh, citing uh, someone who uh, knows uh, a lot about a lot of things, including tariffs, I'm going to refer to uh, Elon Musk and ask what everybody thinks of the implications of Musk's clear uh, support of Trump in this election. All right. So the guy with the most experience with Elon Musk is the man who's one of his biggest customers, the Admiral. <laughs> and, and I have to admit, Elon Musk uh, uh, has has helped me with the uh, with my investment so I cannot fault him too Can't much. Fault him too much. Yeah. But I think his biggest contribution to uh, uh, to Trump at this point is 75 million dollars that he put into Trump's war chest when Trump's war chest needed a boost. Uh, as far as having influence, uh, I'm not sure that uh, Musk has a lot of credibility on many things not musk uh he he ran a good company he runs a good company spacex uh, uh tess uh tesla uh, tesla and the like a uh, good companies uh but it's uh but i don't think he has much credibility as when it comes to politics 
Larry? One need only listen to Donald Trump's discussion the other day of the cylinders coming down to earth and landing on a raft in the sea to realize that he doesn't understand what Elon Musk is doing at all. On the other hand, um, you know, Elon Musk is not a particularly popular figure. He's certainly not as popular as he was a few years ago as people have gotten to know him a little bit better. They're starting to roll back. He's clearly just paying his money like any uh, capitalist would in order to gain advantage for himself. And clearly, uh, he's going to expect some things from Trump. Uh, if Trump is elected, uh, it will be a great joy to me to watch Trump stiff him because what's in it for Trump after he's elected? Nothing. He's not going to run again. And so uh, anybody who supports Donald Trump thinking he's going to do something for them is taking a big chance. And Elon Musk is probably taking the biggest chance of all. Joe Ferretti. Uh, well, Elon Musk is an interesting character. I don't know that he's going to have any more impact on the election than, uh, say, Mark Cuban is going to have or Taylor Swift's going to have supporting Kamala Harris. So I, 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 I don't see what, what that does. I don't think it moves a lot of people. I don't think nationally it's going to move the needle uh, in, in any particular state or nationally in terms of uh, how the voting public looks at all this. Uh, and, and, you know, with... Elon Musk, since he's taken over Twitter and renamed it, or rebranded it X, uh, I mean, he, he said some some crazy things that he's had to apologize for, uh, and uh, you know, he, should, he really is a brilliant man. Should stick to cars and SpaceX and things of that nature, where he has excelled and become a visionary. Uh, politics, uh, him and Mark Cuban and others uh, of that ilk who just have you know uh, money. Uh, to to uh, throw around like they do, I, I don't see that that really helps the politics. But I think we'll see in our day, uh, before any of us depart this earth, we're, we're going to see a candidate come forward for national office who's going to be funded solely by one or two of these billionaires. Uh, and it's going to be a, a sad day for our politics, but I, you can see that coming with uh, the amount of money that these current billionaires are funneling to these campaigns uh we're going to see that in our lifetime and it's going to be uh a sad day mike carl comes back to you well uh did you go Mike? no no oh, i'm sorry, sorry yeah, mike, mike. Hey. yep mike, hey. my bad that's all right i was just afraid I mean, with all the to, cursing yeah. you've been doing yeah. this, this morning <laughs> cut me out um I, i'm i'm i don't think that elon musk's endorsement of trump does a whole lot either way he was the darling of the left before he he endorsed trump and got into twitter and so on and so forth um and he has fallen from grace from the, from the left um so if if you were already a trump fan you are still a trump fan if you're already a, a harris fan you're still a harris fan and that endorsement doesn't didn't do a whole lot what he has done and i think affects the the election is the takeover of twitter now called x and i think he has opened that platform up to be a whole lot uh, more fair than it had been um, in previous elections and we saw what twitter could do in the elections um, with with ads and so on and so forth i think there was a stifling of the right and the opinions of the right on Twitter and his buying that up and and changing that platform, I think has opened it up to both sides. Um, and I think that has done more for the election than any endorsement he could have done for either side. I think Mike's making a very good point here, but I don't think it's for both sides. I think what has shifted from a biasness to the left now to a biasness to the right. And there have been the same accusations that uh, that the uh, uh, that been stifled, that the Republicans are saying, now the Democrats are saying. So I'm not sure that he's achieved the balance that some well, folks Well, Welcome to our world. Dude. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Michael Carl, back to you. Well, in that context, what's right is a free enterprise system, and there's no doubt that, that, that Elon Musk uh, not only understands this, but, but has used it to make billions of dollars. And so I think that his endorsement of Trump is very telling about – uh, how he thinks that Trump will uh, treat the free enterprise system 
and you know with just selective tariffs uh, this, the, dealing with the earlier topic so I, I think it's very meaningful and positive for Trump and when you say left and right right means correct and good for America <laughs> <laughs> the the um, uh, how much money is he made? Music plan there. <laughs> here, how much here. money has he made this year on Twitter? I was hearing that their stock is uh, way down. Yeah, X, I, I mean, oh, oh, sorry, Mr. Musk. X. I don't think uh, he cares. I, yeah, he's got that um, F you money. Okay, but we were talking about what a genius, uh, what a genius he is, and and what a what a clever marketeer he is. He's taken a a pretty bad whipping on tw Twitter, I believe, this year. Pretty bad. I, yeah, I don't think he cares. He's got that kind of money. It doesn't matter to him. He okay, wants then, it to be fair and balanced. Then you agree and, he's and, not a part of the free market system. He's just a political player who's got billions of dollars to play with. No, I think he sees that platform as something that needs to be fair for both sides, and that he makes enough money on the other ones that if you're going to have a platform like this, it needs to be fair. It needs to be open to all. And if he loses money on it, he makes enough money on the other ones not to worry about. But you're saying fair for both sides. Again, I don't. I think he shifted the well, balance. I, right. He shifted the balance because to, it was to, so one-sided. No, 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 not, not to the Two center, balance. Yeah, not to the, yeah two he, balance. He's <laughs> agreed. Yeah. You know, we, we get into this uh, with, with X because it goes into free speech and, and, and such. And I wonder what the restrictions are on free speech when it comes to accuracy. Are there any? Can, defamation can, law can can i can i stop my own weather forecast and tell people there's a giant blizzard coming or a giant yeah, the, the, you would be just and, as correct as the ones that do it for a living <laughs> right and, the other then, day when my phone said it was 38 degrees outside and there was frost everywhere and then as i'm complaining to my wife about it it switches over to 30 degrees <laughs> Wait a minute. it hurt you yes <laughs> yeah Picking up on that, Rob, you and I were talking about this for one right earlier this morning. There's a commercial I saw yesterday. I'm not going to go in detail of the commercial. But prior to the commercial being aired, the radio station said, we do not endorse this. We do not condone this. We're forced to air it. Said that both before and after the commercial. Yeah, and I – as this, this deterioration, hiding under free speech bothers me. Because I can flat out lie about anything because I have free speech. I can just flat out lie and be dishonest about every fact that's out there, and I can hide behind free speech. I have the right to say it. If somebody, if somebody could prove that, that your lying actually led to a, 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 a direct economic loss, then your free speech will be costly. Possibly. Yeah. Costly, but what the ram what the right. there's so, no ramifications, though, Mike. Well, no and ramifications. Well, wealthy get people sued, get sued. Wealthy people have more protection under the First Amendment than poor people or people of middle class means. Sure, because they can't. They'll lose their house. The middle class people. That's what the, if they say that's the what wrong the thing. Contingent fee plaintiffs lawyers are for. Well, maybe so. Well, you, all, but, you we only get paid if well, if, but there's if, also a bankruptcy program out there. So, I mean, you know, you you are in a situation where if you make as much money as Elon Musk or as much money as Donald Trump pretends to make, <laughs> um, then you can lie about people and you know, it's like losing uh, a, a king's ransom on um, Twitter. Uh, stock. And it's it, it doesn't bother you. You can afford to lie. i got a minute left. Hang on, Joe Ferretti. You were about to say something. Well, Rob, you raised an interesting point. And, and it's disinformation, which is causing FEMA workers in western North Carolina to look over their shoulders to see if there's some armed militiamen hunting them down. Uh, you know, that, that's because of the false information that's on the Internet. Uh, I hate to say this, but for legal action to take place, oftentimes there has to be an under underlying regulatory scheme involved so that the plaintiff's lawyer who wants to press an action has a basis in law to do so. And uh, this, 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 this information on the Internet, at some point we're going to have to strike a balance in terms of regulating what can be posted and what can't be posted because there's real-life implications here. People are not getting help in North Carolina because of the misinformation and disinformation that's being published. Yeah, Joe, well stated. And on that note, we'll uh, stop here and be back with uh, the final thoughts. You get eight seconds apiece here. This
Final thoughts on the phone. We start with Joe Ferretti first. Joe, go. The Spring, spring Mills football team is a, is a wonderful story, but that measuring stick is right around the corner. Larry Schultz. Have a very nice weekend. It's going to be beautiful once again. Mr. Stubblefield. Enjoy the Apple Harvest Parade and also uh, Shepherd University Homecoming. Michael Carl. Go Mountaineers and Commanders this weekend. Mr. Michael Height. Uh, I was going to say something about the parade and once Bill again, Stolitz. Mike. Uh, <laughs> two great minds think alike, I guess. Just remember they changed the route yeah. Yeah, they this changed year. The route, yes. Different route. It's uh, 10 o'clock. The Dave Ramsey Show is next. This is Talk Radio, WRNR Martinsburg and TV 10. Have a great weekend, and we'll talk to you again in 70 short hours.